Okay, I think we're going to need to start to stay on time. So, welcome everybody. I hope you've been enjoying the, uh, the conference so far. Um, this is going to be a panel discussion on eBPF, a new era in cloud infrastructure tools. My name is Richard Simon. My daytime job is a Chief Technology Officer at uh, T-Systems. Uh, but just a quick shameless plug, I also do have a YouTube channel called The Cloud Therapist. So next time you're in the YouTube app, please look that up and uh, feel free to subscribe. Okay, so I definitely have the best eBPF panel for you on this side of the Danube River. That's for sure. I can't speak for the other side, but definitely on this side, I have the great eBPF panel for you. Okay, so let's do some intros. Um, so on the right, I have uh, Liz Rice, uh, Chief Technology or Ch Chief Open Source Officer uh, from Isovalent at Cisco. Uh, next to her is Frederick uh, Branchik. He's the founder at uh, Polar Signals. Uh, next person along is Hemanth Mala. He is a Senior Software Engineer at Datadog. And last but not least, uh, Yusheng Zhang, who is an open source developer at Unomia Inc. Okay, so let's uh, dive straight into some Q&A. Um, let's start with some basics first, guys. So, uh, Liz, what is eBPF and what's it useful for? Hi, everyone. So, if you've heard the word eBPF as uh, extended Berkeley packet filter, please put that out of your mind because... It does so much more than packet filtering, it's not even a useful term. So we just use the letters eBPF. And you can think of it as a subsystem within the kernel that lets us run bespoke programs. We can dynamically load programs into the kernel, attach them to, to all sorts of different events, and change the way that the kernel behaves. And that means it's really useful for observing what's happening in the kernel and even responding differently to these events. The events could be functions being called, they could be a network packet arriving at a point in the stack, they could be a security call, and we can modify the way the kernel responds to all these different types of events. So it's a really low level technology, but that can be used as a powerful platform for building all sorts of infrastructure tools. And I'm sure we're gonna talk about some of those tools in this panel. Cool. Uh, so, Frederick, what's the um, um, wh why is kind of eBPF the the sort of you know terms as a useful platform for building cloud infrastructure tools? What's kind of the, the reasoning behind that? I think um, kind of what uh, Liz was talking about the the only way we could extend the kernel prior to eBPF was with kernel modules. And if anybody has ever actually done that, they know that's a painful road. Um, eBPF is not all without pain either, but um, a, a lot of, um, you know, what made um, kernel modules extra painful um, has been solved with eBPF. And one of the big ones um, is we can actually safely extend the kernel with doing so whereas you know kernel modules are completely um you know you can do genuinely everything right with ebpf there there are some guardrails so that um you know we can't do true truly terrible things okay and you shank um normally kind of ebpf is associated with things like observability networking security but what are some of the kind of other less known use cases uh, the mainland kernel has like a scheduler merge this year, so it's like it can control how the process and stress schedule in the system. And also there's some like we can implement a HID driver like a game console. Like I have a Steam Deck as my laptop. Like uh, they have used the eBPF to implement their driver using their system. And also there's some like uh, moving eBPF to user space or for more innovation use cases. Okay, excellent. Um, so just kind of looking at eBPF in the field, Hamanth, what's the, um, what kind of makes it so high performance? And you're, you're a software engineer, so you must be kind of into that sort of stuff. Uh, how does it kind of compare with other approaches? Yeah, um, so I work on the container networking team at Datadog, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, how eBPF is high performing for networking, right? So it's 
mostly about uh, kind, trying to solve for that overhead when you want to transfer data between the kernel space and the user space boundary. So imagine if you're writing like a packet filtering program or mm -hmm. most of you might have run DCP dump, right? So imagine if you're looking for that needle in the haystack and there's a flood of packets you need to process, right? So if you're, if you're moving all of those packets to the user space, you're incurring a lot of overhead. But if you can filter them right in the kernel and just export that needle back up to the user space, you can do a lot of very powerful things. And it does not stop at that. Uh, it goes beyond that, especially with use cases like being able to write uh, load balancers that are capable of doing DDoS protection. Or even if you're in the Kubernetes world, if you want to replace IP tables with eBPF, if you want to get rid of your queue proxy, um, so eBPF allows you to do very performant networking, even for containers. Right. Um, and Liz, is, is there any um, sort of performance challenges when you, you know, when people want to adopt eBPF in sort of cloud environments? What's, what's kind of the story there? So really just building on what Hemant said about, uh, you know, we can avoid the overhead of sending lots of data from the kernel to user space if we can filter in the kernel. If we try and collect information about every single possible event and send it all into user space, we, you know, we won't be able to keep up. We will, you know, affect the performance of the system. But one of the things that we've been able to do with eBPF because it's so programmable mm -hmm. is you can uh, filter events. You can be very sort of custom about what events you're interested in how much data you're going to send into user space. And we can build some incredibly high performance tools. So to give an example, Cilium Tetragon, which is a security observability and enforcement project, uh, we can do, I mean, you can build a benchmark for anything, but one of the benchmarks we did was to uh, observe every file read that happens while you build the Linux kernel. So it's something, I want to say 6 million file reads or something. And the overhead was tiny. It was kind of under 2% CPU usage for being able to observe all of those file reads. So you can build eBPF programs in a sort of pathological way and they would impact performance. But if you're clever about it, you can build some incredibly powerful and low overhead tools. Right. And Frederick, what's the um, kind of in, in terms of operational challenges for managing eBPF program? What's kind of your your take on doing that in a, in a production environment? So I think the biggest one is that there are still, you know, eBPF is still actively being worked on. Um, and there are features um, that you, you know, may not be actually capable of using when it only just landed in the kernel, right? Um, so just an example, we actually um, build all of our write all of our BPF programs so that they're um, compatible all the way back to 5.3. Uh, sometimes even further than that, and that comes with challenges because you know as much as we would like to, we cannot actually use uh, the most modern um, things that have landed in um, in eBPF world. So I think that that continues to be uh, probably the the biggest hurdle. Other than you know you need very, very high privileges to be able to load BPF programs. And so um, that tends to be, you know, once we go, you know, to, to users and they want to use our product um, or our project, um, once we've gone over that hurdle where the, you know, security team has said, okay, this is actually okay to use, then t typically we don't actually have that many problems anymore Two, three years ago, this looked very different. Mm -hmm. People didn't know what eBPF was. People were very scared of, you know, giving it uh, relatively high privileges. Um, so, yeah, I think once the security boundary has been, you know, resolved, um, we don't actually find that many hurdles anymore. It was different. Okay, just ago. a side, side question on that. So that sort of initial investment that you're making, you said there's like backwards compatibility, right? So that's always there so that, you know, people can kind of, you know, be able to use future releases as well if they need to, but there is that capability within, you know, within the solution, within that uh, whole environment. Okay, cool. Um, 
So let's have a let's have kind of a bit of a conversation around sort of how you learn eBPF. So Yusheng, um, should every developer learn how to write eBPF programs? I think no. Let's use the mic. Okay. I think uh, there's no such need, but certainly you maybe worth to try a lot of product they're already using eBPF like Cilium or Tetragon, but actually you didn't need to write eBPF yourself. Okay, thank you. And Heman, um, what kind of tools and educational resources are there to sort of help that barrier, lower that barrier of, you know, for developers to learn it? Yeah. Um, so one of the tool that comes to my mind is this um, tool called BPF Trace. So BPF Trace has this custom DSL that allows you to write very simple one-liners that allow you to get uh, information from your kernel directly. So we were able to solve a bunch of really complex incidents at Datadog by just using BPF Trace because we were able to dynamically get uh, information that was not available from any other sources. So, and BPF Trace also has a lot of tools out of the box. Um, so for example, you wanna understand um, what are the processes that are exiting or what are the processes that are opening something. So there are really out of the box tools that you can just run. And these programs basically install BPF programs for you uh, on your behalf. So, but you don't have to write BPF programs from scratch, right? So this is a very good way to like, you know, take a look at the program, see what it's doing and kind of use it uh, immediately. And other than that, uh, the great thing about BPF is uh, the community has been really great. And most of the companies that are building these tools on top of eBPF are generally open source. So uh, I can talk for Datadog, like a lot of our products that are built on top of Datadog, they're all part of our Datadog agent, which is open source. So one of the good way to like learn about it is if you're interested in a specific use case, just go to github.com, have that uh, hook point or whatever you're interested in and see who's using it and how they're using it. And that gets you really far. And if you're interested in learning more, there are conference talks. Uh, eBPF Summit is something that happens every year. And there are uh, folks from all companies trying to talk about new and emerging use cases. And there's Cilium and eBPF Day, which is a co-located event that happens as a part of KubeCon. Uh, it's a full day event, so there are talks there. And if you're interested in learning more technical details, you can look at uh, Linux Plumbers Conference or uh, even more if you uh, LSF and MBPF. Uh, so yeah, there are a lot of conference talks. And uh, there are Cilium and Echo office hours. You can like drop by and ask questions. Liz has a great book called Learning eBPF. Um, and Brendan Gregg has a great book as well. So there are a ton of resources today. Great. Uh, do you want to add? Just wanted to, just to come in. I wanted to also mention the Cilium and eBPF Slack, which is full of people like... I think everyone here on the panel <laughs> um, and a lot of people who are really, you know, willing to help answer questions. But I would say for most people, uh, most people don't need to actually program eBPF themselves. Like Yusheng said, it's, it, you know, there are a lot of tools like BPF, like Cilium, like, you know, um, Parker that bring the kind of level of abstraction up so that you don't actually have to be a kernel programmer because, when you start writing eBPF code, you quite quickly start running into kernel data structures, and then you kind of have to understand the consequences of changing those kernel data structures. So um, it, it is a pretty steep learning curve if you want to build your own tools. But there are tons of these higher level abstractions and different projects that can give you the power of eBPF without you having to learn all sorts of details about kernel programming unless you want to because if you want to then it's fun <laughs> and just just stay with you for a second Liz um, so the eBPF virtual summit was on last week that's right, right. which I think which was quite cool um, where, where's the where's the uh, resources for that now where's all the videos for now yeah all the videos for that are on YouTube so if you go to eBPF.io which is a, a site full of all sorts of eBPF related resources you'll find the links to, there to the summit and to the YouTube and to I think all the presentations have or soon will be uploaded there, there were tons of really good interesting talks cool Hamath did you want to come in again 
just wanted to add a point on um, kernel structures, right? So BPF trace also has this um, very cool helper command, like I think it's called BPF trace minus L, that kind of gives you um, the struct definition. So you don't have to go hunting in the kernel source. It'll actually tell you the exact struct definition. And when you write a function with BPF trace, you can just look up that struct and extract fields out of it. So that's really handy. Maybe you can also try let chat GPT O one write write BPI trace program for you. Okay, let's pass it down. Okay, so uh, on to Frederick. Uh, quick question for you. Uh, we've kind of talked about educational resources and various tools that can kind of ab abstract us, as we said. Um, but how can we make it more friendly and easier, even than that? What's your suggestions for developers? <sighs> Or anybody really who wants to take advantage of it. I, I, I think that's I think that's a really hard one because EBPF is one of those things where it's hard, but it's hard for a reason, right? Like and if you really wanna go go down and understand everything, you just have to put in the time uh, for that, I think. But there are useful abstractions uh, that are and have been built um so you know many years ago we didn't have like the compile ones run everywhere um tool chains um uh, cilium has built the like go ebpf library that is very very good um libbpf like all of these things um a couple years ago it was tremendously painful to even get started and now at least you know getting started is actually pretty easy so I, I think it's just, you know, with time, we'll build better and better abstractions. I don't know that I have, you know, uh, an eye-opening answer here, but, you know, I think it's about putting in the time and building the right abstractions. Okay. All right. So you, you guys have convinced me. I, I definitely want to contribute to eBPF. So Yusheng, um, how can people contribute to the open source eBPF development? Uh... One thing from my experience is that maybe you can try some steady analysis tools to try to find some bugs in like libpf, bpf tool, or even in kernel, so you can quickly do some bug fix and contribute to them. And you can also search for projects in github.com, or you can see the there's a page in ebpf.io. There's a, a bunch of lists of a bunch of applications and infrastructures, you can look at them and contribute to them. Uh, something I wanted to add. Uh, so another big unlock with BPF is also using BPF for network performance tuning. So if you identify opportunities in your infrastructure stack and you know more about your infrastructure stack than people who are building the software in a general purpose way. So if you identify opportunities like that, BPF allows you to, you know, change the kernel's behavior and make those optimizations. So Cilium does a bunch of optimizations like that out of the box. So one of the examples is um, there's this feature called um, BPF host routing that basically allows you to um, avoid the double network traversal f with containers. So in containers, you traverse the stack once in the pod network namespace and then again on the host. So with BPF, you can take the packet right from the VETH and send it to the physical device. Um, optimizations like that. And at Datadog and even large companies like um, Meta and Google, there are optimizations on TCP itself. Like for example, tuning things like TCP retransmit timeouts. So the kernel has a one second hard-coded initial retransmit timeout. So if you want to change that, you can do it with BPF. Um, and there are a lot of things that you can tune out of the box. There are a few papers from Meta and Google that talk about how they tune the network stack dynamically based on their infrastructure. But if you know that your stack has specific requirements and you kind of see those opportunities, BPF allows you to like go and change them uh, without having to like rebuild the kernel source. Yeah. Okay, and just a side note, open to anybody who wants to answer this one. Um, how are we seeing the, the the take up from established vendors of eBPF? What's kind of happening there? I think Liz wanted to. I nearly added this to what Hemant was just saying. Anyway, really nice um, stat, I guess, from you know these 
really, you know, hyper scaled companies like Meta, every single packet that's gone to and from Meta since 2016 has been processed by BPF. So, you know, it's been used at scale for, we're getting quite close to a decade. Um, Netflix is another, you know, very high profile early user. I think someone mentioned Brendan Gregg before, who was one of the um, kind of early evangelists really for eBPF and using it for um, profiling systems, understanding where performance bottlenecks are, really tracing, you know, there's, there's an amazing book that Brendan wrote about using eBPF for tracing pretty much any aspect of the performance of your system. You can measure it, understand it with eBPF. And yeah, it's been used at scale by these companies for years. And now we're seeing mass adoption of the kind of higher level abstractions, you know, like Cilium, um, uh, like Falco, like, uh, I'm struggling to think of <laughs> other project, but all these, uh, and BPF Trace has been used very widely for a long time. And, you know, Fortune 500 companies around the world are using this technology now and particularly underpinning their networking. Yeah. Okay. So, um, a little bit of a challenge for you guys. So I read an article. This way, in, <laughs> yeah. um, I read an article in the new stack, um, and it was called "Bypassing eBPF to Protect Kubernetes Runtimes." It's by a company called Operant. Um, and some of the I won't go through the whole thing, of, of course, but some of the comments that were made, um, uh, for example, by the CEO of Operant, he said that eBPF has or produces too much data and too much noise. That was one of the things. The other one was kind of um, eBPF is a bit of an open floodgate or firehose approach to things. Um, what's your what's your take on that? And anybody can can, can answer that. So of course, um, you know, if you're tracing absolutely everything, that one does come with a cost, um, you know, just like, I don't know, in a database, as if you're writing more data, that's going to cost you more, right? Like, um, so, yeah, but if, I understand this company basically was able to solve their problems without eBPF, and that's perfectly fine as well, right? Like, we don't have to, just because we see this one technology, have to solve all of our problems now with this one technology, right? Um, so eBPF is great for, for a lot of things, but we also don't, you know, have to cargo cult it. Um, so yeah, I think that's my, my opinion. It's great for them if they manage to solve their problems without. Cool. Anybody else want to? Um, so the BPF verifier allows you to not do terrible things and crash your kernel, but it does not stop you from writing bad performant code, right? So imagine if you're hooking on to hook points on HA proxy on your edge where you're receiving all your traffic from your customers and you do that on syscalls you should not, you're going to introduce latency on every request serving and you're going to quickly blow up the CPU on those nodes. So you need to be careful about how you're using and why you're using it. And if, for the right use cases, I think eBPF is great, and but it just does not apply for everything. Okay, excellent. Yeah, and I suppose um, maybe kind of taking that approach as well means that you're kind of you know taking things into your own hands rather than maybe following a more uh, standard. Uh, Yushen, did you want to come in? No. Okay, right. Okay. <laughs> Lucy, do you want to come in at all? Are you, are you okay? We're good. Okay, all right. So let's move on to um, eBPF futures. So what's on the horizon for eBPF? Um, what's kind of the role uh, that we see it kind of playing in the in the future, this whole sort of cloud native space. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about, uh, actually, this week at, at Linux Plumbers, there's going to be a talk on um, improving Google search performance with eBPF's uh, Skeddy XT. So Skeddy XT is this new thing that's coming up with eBPF, where you can actually tune your general purpose Linux scheduler to do custom things. So historically changing the kernel scheduler has been a very hard thing. Uh, and understanding how different schedulers perform is also really tricky, but kind of bringing that power of eBPF to schedulers, process schedulers is very, very powerful. And Google's already seeing uh, significant gains 
throughout their Google search. So there's going to be a talk about it at, at LPC. Um, so there's uh, one key thing for eBPF is that uh, eBPF is designed for innovation. So there's surely a lot of new use cases coming to eBPF. I, I heard there was also one in talking about like eBPF for memory and for I.O. in Linux Plumber. I guess the other big area that's worth mentioning is eBPF for Windows, which, you know, it, it's originally been built in Linux, but the the concepts, you know, Microsoft have an open source project called eBPF for Windows. You can go and check it out. At Summit last week, it was a really, you know, there were a lot of people really excited about, you know, the fact that that exists and, um, you know, the possibilities that that can bring to, you know, extending another, you know, I think probably here most people are, using Linux or more familiar with Linux, but, you know, Windows is apparently quite popular. So uh, it will be yeah, really great to see that kind of innovation that we're talking about also being applied in that Windows world as well. Right. The, the Windows kernel, I think, certainly needs a little bit of segregation right now, I would say. <laughs> I'm in agreement with that. I, I was also going to mention the uh, user space or the scheduling. Um, I, I'm, I'm very excited not just to see hyperscalers use it, but you know how we can improve, you know, more ordinary workloads as well. I'm sure we'll see schedulers, uh, you know, um, optimized for specific workloads like databases. There's probably going to be a Postgres scheduler um, sooner rather than later. Um, and, and another one that I'm really excited about, um, and this is already, you know, underway. Um, like user space tracing has been higher overhead than we probably would have wanted. And so there's a lot of innovation happening there as well. So that, you know, not just every, basically everything that we've been talking about here has ever always been, you know, we don't need to do any context switches between user space and kernel space. And this is why it's awesome. But user space tracing is actually really useful. Um, but that, you know, has, has that overhead kind of inherently at the moment. Um, so yeah, making user space uh, tracing cheaper is also something I'm quite excited about. Right, fantastic. Well, that's all the questions we had. Um, I want to thank the panel. I told you they were good. Um, so Liz Rice, thank you very much for, for your time. And um, Frederick Branchik, uh, thank you to you. Hamath Mala as well, uh, and Yusheng Zhang as well. Um, I think they deserve a round of applause, guys. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. If anybody has any questions, yep, hands up already. <laughs> Just put your hand up and I'll pass you the mic if that's okay. So let's do that. Thank you. Uh, what does the uh, development process look like? Let me pass that back. Yeah, there we go. So I guess I immediately, I'm wondering whether you mean the development process for uh, the eBPF platform within the kernel, which is essentially Linux kernel contributions, or if you mean the development process for building things on top of BPF. Okay, so uh, the verifier has briefly been mentioned before. Essentially, you're going to write code in you could write it in eBPF bytecode. I don't recommend it. Most people are writing, I would say, in C, or these days you can also write in Rust, and even Java we're hearing about now. Um, and that code is being compiled to eBPF bytecode, then loaded into the kernel at runtime, and then going through this verification process. The... Um, the workflow, I would say, for eBPF, a lot of it is going to involve figuring out why the verifier has rejected your code <laughs> and adjusting accordingly. The verifier is one of the areas of eBPF that's improved a lot, I would say, over the last couple of years. So when I was first getting involved with it, you'd get code rejected and the messages were, let's say, obscure. I don't know whether it's the messaging has improved or my ability to kind of work out what it's trying to tell me, um, but it, it seems to me that it's it's much easier to understand why your code is not passing verification these days. Um, yeah. I, I think one of the things um, that when people haven't worked with um, eBPF is it's literally a target when you invoke Clang. Like, 
usually you say, you know, um, x86, whatever. Um, with eBPF, it's just BPF is the target, and then it produces a um, BPF bytecode um, artifact. Um, I think just one, one more thing uh, to add about the verifier. The one thing that's pretty frustrating is that, um, you know, albeit that the verifier has gotten better, sometimes it also just changes, right? And so you need to actually verify on all the versions uh, that you would possibly want to um, run your BPF program on. And so that's, you know, one of those things where when I say, you know, it can be a little bit painful uh, working with this. But at the end of the day, once you've, you know, set this up once in CI, you're kind of good to go. But those are the kinds of things that you're probably going to run on into if you know, not just building it for yourselves. And um, like with everything static analysis, the BPF verifier isn't perfect either. So don't expect it to be 100% perfect. We've literally had uh, code bases with comments that say, here only to please the verifier. Um, so yeah, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Pass on to you. I'm sorry, I have three questions. Is that allowed, three questions? Um, no. Got a little bit of time. So is it okay? We can do it. <laughs> okay, well, the, the uh, first question is, <clears throat> you're talking about the levels of abstraction. So when I'm, you know, working with Datadog, looking at different observability uh, functionalities, I'm not going to choose even Cilium or EPPF. I'm just, how does that work? Um, I'm, it's going to be running underneath the hood, so to speak, but, you know, you don't need to know anything about EPPF. That's, that's the that's the uh, the goal here, right? So I'm just curious, you know, when I'm working with Datadog, for example, or Polar Signals or other things, um, I'm just wondering how that appears to the um, ops operations person. And the second question is, um, I, I would think that uh, Tetragon is more oriented towards, um, let's say a question for Liz, towards uh, Kubernetes and cloud native as far as that Kubernetes abstractions go uh, or not. And that kind of, when they're talking about the, the new stack article, which you wrote, uh, or read, sorry, it talked about overcoming that their system was better or offered improvements compared to EBPF, but I think you can maybe give the counter arguments with, for example, what Tetragon might be able to do. Third question is, um, you, know, you mentioned the uh, kernel development. So um, it's, it's been kind of a, I don't want to say war, but it's controversy in general over Rust being better <laughs> for EBPF. So uh, how's that playing out? in EBPF kernel development. Um, I'm thinking it just depends. That's what I think. But I'd like to know your thoughts. Okay. Shall I start with the Tetragon question since yeah. that one was specifically? So um, for those who don't know, Tetragon is a part of Cilium. It's, it's a sort of standalone project that you can run independently of Cilium, but it's kind of emerged from the Cilium project. And it allows us to have um, security profiles that you can attach to different events and, and report on kind of security events uh, and even block those events. Now, you can use Tetragon directly on a host. It doesn't have to be used with containers or Kubernetes, but it can be. Now, in the Linux kernel, on, there is no there is no such thing as a container. You know, there's no kernel concept that represents a container. So there's sort of stitching together of various different concepts like namespaces and C groups that are done by your container runtime, by, you know, your Docker or your container D and, and sort of Kubernetes abstractions over the top of that. That the Linux kernel really is, isn't particularly aware of. So something like Tetragon is stitching that information together and presenting it to you so that you can see, well, if you are running under Kubernetes, what was the pod in what namespace on what node that a particular event happened. But if you're running in a sort of native host environment, you're going to know things like, okay, what was the process ID? And there is no container ID to, to think about. So I don't know if that answered the Tetragon question. And I will pass on to somebody else to answer the other questions. 
So um, I didn't fully grasp the Datadog part of the question. So what's the question on? For a typical user, um, and they're going to use, for example, and they're looking at observability, they have Prometheus, et cetera, Kubernetes, whatever they're doing. But um, you're looking at, say, Datadog um, at the console. What, you know, how's BPF going to show up? Or, I know it's yeah. a lot of things, but just what? Got it. Yeah, so if you're doing a good job, you shouldn't really notice it, right? So the whole idea is that our tools abstract on top of that. Uh, we're using eBPF to make sure we're able to get the right telemetry with the lowest store head possible. Um, so we're going to use that to kind of generate higher level signals um, so that you can actually work with your business context and you don't have to worry about whether where my programs are attached or what programs are attached or things like that. Um, but if you're using, so there are two parts to this, right? So there is, if you're a security customer, there could be rules that allow you to detect uh, malicious intent. And then there are policies that you can actually put in place to do some sort of remediation when something bad happens, right? So when you see remediation applied, there could be BPF programs uh, that kind of act on it. So if you go onto your host, you should be able to see them. But the idea is that they're all abstracted away. Um, so at Polar Signals, we use um, eBPF to build a profiler so that we can see the, like down to the line number where CPU resources are being spent, right? Um, and a uh, little bit of like, uh, company and open source project history, we actually started out not using eBPF for this, right? Uh, we actually used a completely different mechanism to um, obtain this data. Um, and so that just kind of goes to show that, you know, it just happened to be the right tool for the job, but you don't actually, unless you're, you know, you dig in and, um, you know, try to understand how the profiler itself works, you're not going to know that eBPF is being used under the hood. Okay, I think we can take. Okay, I think we can take one more question, gentlemen. Would you mind passing the mic down? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. So, um, with the kind of follow-up uh, for trust, um part on the future of BPF, uh, so it seems like BPF is starting to go out of the kernel space and into a user space. For example, with uh, BPF time and also like there's the standardization of BPF with um, IEEE. So that kind of goes into overlap with a, another technology, um, WebAssembly, WebSim. So I was wondering what the panel think, like how does, what's the difference, what's the common point and which one would be better for what kind of use case? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your question. So first, from the design perspective, uh, eBPF is designed for performance. WebAssembly is designed for isolation. So eBPF has no such runtime protection like SFI. Instead, it use the verifier to ensure there's no bug when it's running. This first thing. Another thing is that eBPF is designed for like extensions you you don't want to rather like run your game or run like entire http server inside the ebpf you typically you are just want to run some monitoring tools like net pack, net packet filters some type of extension logic inside of bpf excellent maybe we can did you did you want to answer them okay uh, we can maybe take just one more can I, can I just, uh, yeah, I'll just, I just wanted to add one other thing on there, which is, um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think you can use WASM to change the way the kernel is behaving, where, it, you know, that that's probably the, the main thing that we're doing with, with eBPF. I was just something that triggered, the, <laughs> um, we've talked about how, you know, just because you can do something with eBPF doesn't mean you should, and this, I'm very much going into this territory now, but, um, uh, with uh, developments like uh, the ability to run timers in BPF, 
So we can use a BPF timer to schedule more BPF programs, which means we can run an unlimited number of BPF programs, which means that BPF is now Turing complete and we can run anything. Somebody is doing a talk later this week at Linux Plumbers about writing Doom in BPF. So I'm, I don't think it's the best way of implementing Doom, but I think it's awesome that it can be. <laughs> Okay, I think we're out of time. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, I'm sure the guys will be more than happy to connect with you and catch you at one of the events. So thanks very much again for attending, and thanks to the panel again. <laughs> <laughs>